My name is Corey Brotherson. I am a freelance writer. I came straight from university, did an MA in journalism, and then ended up actually doing a staff writing job at a video games website called uh, Games Domain. From there, things kind of cascaded where I ended up working for Yahoo. I did some freelance work for Eurogamer, Game Central, comic books. Ended up at PlayStation for 11 and a half years. We're here at the world famous Silverstone circuit. I'm here at Gamescom 2012 in the place where it's all happening. Right now, I am writing for a game called Windrush Tales, which is a interactive fiction game, which involves the player to take the place of a person who has come on the Windrush ship and experience what life was like coming into Britain during 1950s. I've been working in the games industry for 18 and a half years now and I've had lots of different experiences, I've worked in lots of different companies and I've made incredible friends, I've met my wife. I still suffer from imposter syndrome and for, for something like this, this is an absolutely wonderful experience to even, even think about it. Hello, well, welcome to the very first Ensemble Salon, which feels very fancy. I like that we're not just calling it, you know, another video interview in, in the year that is 2020. We've gone for a salon and I like it a lot. I'm hugely excited to be here tonight to interview Corey Brotherson. He has, I mean, as you just heard, he has been in this industry for 20 years. He has had an incredible career. I'm almost frightened, Corey to ask you my first question, which is to tell me about your career journey. Because as you said earlier, that could just be the full hour. I, I, yeah, yeah. I think this will, this will pretty much the only question that you'll get to ask me for the whole duration. <laughs> um, yes, uh, let, me, let me tell you a, a 20 year tale of woe. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm settling in. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's actually a very varied and, uh, and hopefully a happy tale for most of the part. Um, I mean, I started off uh, gaming when I was very, very young. So kind of like four years old or thereabouts. And this is during the, the 80s. Uh, and for the longest period of time, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and then I got reached about 11 years old and I was like looking around. I was just like, wait a minute, I'm surrounded by games and books and games magazines and comic books. And it's like, well, maybe I should just be a writer. Um, so, so I kind of set my, my sights on, on basically that after that point. Um, but because it was the, at that particular point, it was the 90s, um, my careers advisor was like, well, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I went, I want to be a games journalist. I want to be a writer. And the careers advisor was like, okay. <laughs> so, because at that point, there was no clear path to be a writer. There was no clear path to be a games journalist. Um, there was a clear path to be a journalist, but not necessarily the fields that I wanted to be. Um, so, at that point, I made the realization that um, it was probably best for me to say that I wanted to be a journalist <laughs> after that. Um, and especially because we had like, I think we had like Trevor McDonald as the only kind of major main black journalist in the mainstream public eye. Um, and that kind of got people going, oh, yes, you want to be Trevor McDonald the second. That's, that's very good. So, <laughs> so it got people on side a little bit. Um, but there was a couple of things that I, I noticed very, very quickly um, when I wanted to be a games journalist and slash writer. The first thing was that um, many games journalists didn't actually have many formal qualifications at that particular point. Um, when they ever talked about their career in the actual magazines or anything, um, they usually said that they didn't have um, like uh, anything more than maybe A-levels at the very most. They usually had experience, but, uh, but no university degrees or anything like that. And then the second thing I noticed was there was only one black person in the entire games industry that I was aware of at that particular time, because there was no internet. Um, and some magazines didn't have any profile pictures. Um, so the main black person I knew was a guy called Oz Brown, who was the designer for magazines like Me Machines and CVG. Um, and obviously he wasn't a writer, so it was like, okay, so what do I do? <laughs> so um, I thought, okay, aim is to be super employable, like Teflon. <laughs> it's like no one could like reject me if I was going for a job. So I went and got a BA in English language and literature. Um, I wrote for a student magazine. I then went and uh, to Bournemouth and did an MA in multimedia journalism, uh, which was the second year that I think they were doing that course. Um, because the internet was so fresh <laughs> at the time. 
<laughs> so, um, so yeah, I thought, you know, oh, this whole new internet thing, I may as well try and jump on board with that. Um, so funnily enough, at the MA, I, I got a placement um, at a site called Games Domain, which was bizarrely enough back in my hometown in Birmingham. Um, and after they said, stay in touch um, if an opportunity opens up we'll be able to bring you on board, hopefully, uh, because we liked your work. Um, bizarrely enough, when I finished my dissertation, an opportunity opened up, not because I, you know, bumped anybody off or anything. It's just amazing opportunity. <laughs> um, and I slotted straight in. Um, so it was, I was first started off as a staff writer, um, which was, Games Domain was actually at the time one of the biggest um, internet sites for video games. Uh, it was kind of like it was, kind of just behind IGN, um, a little bit ahead of GameSpot. Um, but it was it was very old in the sense of it's been around since the, the conception of the internet. Um, so it had a massive audience base. Um, so I started off there. I became a console editor quite quickly. Um, I even started doing um, a few bits and pieces on the side just as part of that, um, a very little known fact. I was on TV um, for about a month as like a kind of co-anchor for a video game slot for this uh, TV show called Revved Up, which was essentially um, a kind of petrol head show. And uh, what they had is they wanted to review all these car games. So they got me and a few of my friends, they put us in this like dingy basement area and they just had us play games nonstop for an entire day. They filmed it all and I was doing this kind of like, you know, little potted reviews of each game. Um, and then they stuck it into the actual show. Um, what I didn't know at the time, because I was telling my family, I'm going to be on TV. So I was on my TV for a whole month. What I didn't know is that because it was a petrol head show and because it was the 90s, well, sorry, the early 2000s, um, they kind of slotted my slot in between like, you know, lots of car stuff and like max power bits and pieces and scantily clad ladies that were actually at these events. So it didn't turn out to be my finest hour, <laughs> but it was something. Um, so um, after that, the, uh, the dot-com bubble, bubble kind of burst um, and Games Domain, which was owned by BT, got sold to Yahoo. So I moved to London and I became a games producer for Yahoo. And I was there for about, um, about a year and a half. Um, unfortunately, that didn't go very well. Um, I was actually the owner of the site for a period of time because when we got sold to Yahoo, not many people wanted to moved to London. Um, so I was literally the only surviving member of my team that went there. Um, but there was a lot of discussions over what they wanted to do with the site. Um, and then I went through like a, a really traumatic experience on a, on a personal level where I lost someone. Um, and I was still grieving. I went back to work too early. I uh, got really, really ill, ended up in hospital and then decided that there was more to life than being utterly, utterly miserable um, with what I was doing. So I decided to move back to Birmingham and go freelance for a couple of years. Um, that opened up a few more doors. Uh, so I was freelancing for companies like Shana said, like Eurogamer and Game Central and PlayStation. Um, again, a little bit of a little known fact, I did a tiny, tiny bit of voice acting. Um, I am nowhere near as accomplished as yourself or one of my bosses, Abu, <laughs> who is uh, obviously a you know, Hollywood star now. Um, but I did a tiny bit of voice acting for this uh, comic book um, production, which never got made <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so um, it was me just kind of dabbling in lots of different bits and pieces. Um, I did a little, that's what I actually started my comic book career as well. Um, started doing a lot of short stories and a little bit of editing and anthologies. Um, had a really close encounter with Marvel and DC Comics. Unfortunately, nothing ever happened with it, but it kind of gave me a taste of what I wanted to do on top of the fact that I was working in games. Um, but after about two years of freelancing, I got kind of tired of eating noodles and, uh, <laughs> and not earning any money. Um, so uh, opportunity for PlayStation opened up for full-time work as a uh, content producer. So... I interviewed for that and um, that went really well, even though it was condensing like effectively three interviews in one. So it was very intense. Um, but I ended up interviewing for that, got the job and um, ended up staying there for 11 years um, doing all sorts. I was working for 
playstation.com writing editorial um, I worked for PlayStation Blog. I did a little bit of video work before um, before PlayStation Access. Obviously, you're super familiar with PlayStation Access. Before that <laughs> became a thing, I think they saw my work doing all my presentation work and on like on YouTube. I was like, yeah, let's get some professionals in. <laughs> so- <laughs> no, no, the the inspiration. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We'll, we'll we'll go with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, so yeah, I did I did live a lot of uh, lots of different things while I was working PlayStation. And um, I mean, there were ups and downs, as they were would be for any period of time of that length working. Um, but I, I, I met some incredible people there that became my friends. I met my wife there, so I'm, I'm forever grateful to PlayStation for that. And I met lots of important people who effectively gave me the foundation to do what I kind of end up doing now. Um, so. What I did after 11 years at PlayStation is that I left again and effectively went freelancing. Um, And because I spent those 11 years at PlayStation developing my comic book work and and creating series and editing for children's book uh, publisher called Butterfly Books and and doing all sorts of things in my spare time while I was working for PlayStation, I got to meet um, Shella Ramanan, who is um, the co-creator of Before I Forget, who works for... um, Free, uh, free fold and also Ubisoft Massive, I think, at the moment. Um, and that's when we got working on Windrush Tales, uh, which was like a narrative game, which is still in development, but we're still, we're still putting it together, um, which kind of got me on the whole games dev train after that point. And it kind of gave me the opportunity to, to spread my wings a little bit more. So when I left PlayStation um, after those 11 years, I was actually still freelancing with them. Uh, and then after that, I started kind of dabbling in other bits and pieces as well. So I was still editing for Butterfly Books. I was still working on the comic books. Uh, but I also started working as a content producer for King Games, um, doing content work and social work for uh, Crash Bandicoot on the run. And uh, I also got picked up by Silver Rain Games as well. So as a narrative designer. So um I'm now working on stuff which I can't talk much about. <laughs> um, I'm also working on other stuff which is like for other companies which I can't which I can't say too much about either. Um, but that's kind of led me up to this particular moment in time. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody. That was great. <laughs> that's all we've got time for. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. You know, like I said, you have had an incredible career. For me, it's. I think one of the things I find so interesting is talking to people about their journeys into games and they're really kind of meandering and they often took really kind of interesting turns because games is quite a young industry. And so people had to have, you know, what I was going to say real careers as if our jobs aren't real, but you know what I mean? Kind of (laughs) more traditional careers before they moved into games. But for you, you know, you've done so many different things, but they really, they all coalesce so beautifully into the the kind of career you have now and the the umbrella of, of work that you do. What for you kind of made you want to take that jump into very explicitly game development? Because, you know, obviously I'm a games journalist too. And it's a very fun job. So what made you think, <laughs> do you know what? No, I've got to get, I've got to get stuck into the actual game dev. Uh, I, I had a terrible, terrible dream one day. And I thought I'm going to pursue <laughs> that dream. No, it's, um, I think it's the, it was the perfect amalgamation of my interest from 11 year old me, uh, which was, I loved fiction. I loved working on fiction um, and I loved games and the game journalism thing was, was something that I was, it's like my heart was absolutely set on. Um, But I did games journalism for for several years and then I kind of got assimilated into games marketing through PlayStation. And I think during that period of time, when I was working on the comic books, I realized that the fiction was something that, um, my heart was also really set on and I never really had the chance to express myself in that. So while I was doing the comic books, I really thought I'd, I'd love to do games writing at some point. And um, I really kind of started to dabble here and there in, in kind of ways of, of potentially doing that. And to be fair, I had a few opportunities um, kind of like towards the, the back end of my, uh, of my marketing career where um, I was like, talking to other companies and I actually got headhunted by a, um, a big AAA company at one point uh, to join their team and uh, unfortunately that well I say unfortunately because at the time it was just like oh you know it's a shame that never worked out um, but 
you know, obviously I got the opportunities what I have now, so I'm super grateful for that instead. But, um, but yeah, it really was the perfect way to be able to express my love for, for fiction in a medium which has been part of my life for the better part of like 36 years or something like that. So, um, yeah, it, I think that, that's what it was. And, and being able to be part of that, being able to be part of, of incredible people, incredible teams, and being able to collaborate and express myself in, a, in a such a, I guess, such a fun, diverse way is, is such a, a really, really big blessing for me. So I want to talk storytelling because, you know, that really is at the heart of what you do. You know, you work in comics, you work in game dev, you have been a writer for, you know, decades. Sorry to say that, (laughs) but you did mention earlier that your career predates the internet. So really that's on you, that you did that. Um, And then, then, you know, of course, uh, you know, as I said, you kind of work in publishing, you work in games, you work in comics, you've been a writer, you know, a a journalist and a kind of um, marketing writer. So everything you do has always been about communication, about telling stories. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in what for you is good storytelling? When are you personally looking at your work and thinking, do you know what? I did a great job there. Um, Yeah, good question. It's it's one of those things where I think my idea of good score storytelling has probably changed over a long period of time. Um, and when I was younger, good storytelling for me was being able to kind of express a really kind of um, a spectacular kind of meandering idea sort of thing and, and, and engage the engage the audience through kind of bells and whistles. And as I got older, it's like, I realized I got to appreciate more the the simplicity of a really strong idea, a really good story told exceptionally well. Um, And having grown up with games where the first few games were like literally blobs of color (laughs) being knocked around the screen, obviously visual fidelity has has changed storytelling over the the, the mediums kind of uh, 70 years now. and for me personally, I think not only that visual story, that visual fidelity, and also allowing that show don't tell ethos through visual storytelling, which is super important, but also being able to align the desire of the player and the, the narrative of the story that's being told. Um, because I think it's really easy to think that good storytelling is through um, lots of choice and being able to give player an exceptional amount of choice. But as we've seen with games like um, God of War or um, the Naughty Dog titles like Uncharted or The Last of Us, they're very story driven and they're very focused on that particular story. And generally speaking, there's a, there's a lot less choice in those sorts of games by comparison to like RPGs or what have you. Um, but they're still held up as some of the best examples of storytelling in the medium um and for me that kind of comes down to that sense of aligning and unlocking that player's desire what the player wants from the game and how they feel along with the character that they're playing as um i think if i move away from AAA games um a really good example for me is like um the return of opera din um which is for me is just phenomenal just absolutely incredible game um stuff like that stuff like hades and pendragon or doing stuff which we don't typically see too much um over the, the the whole medium's kind of life cycle um and they're very much indie kind of spheres um but i think it's because they what they do is they they lock into that ethos where for example with oprah din um, for those that haven't played it, it's like you effectively, you're, it's effectively a detective game and you're trying to find out what's happened in this kind of 19th century ship where all these murders have happened. Um, and you as a player are trying to detect exactly the deaths, what have got caused the deaths of every single person on that ship and why it happened. And the story itself is a very a relatively basic story but it's an exceptionally engaging story and they've broken it up into several parts that are told in a non-linear narrative, uh, which is exceptionally difficult to do. But the way that it's told is by using 
the smaller parts of visual storytelling. It's, it's asking you questions in the same way that you will be asking questions as a detective. So you're asking what has happened here? Why has this happened? How could this happen? And with all those little tiny bits of visual storytelling that you're getting in the game, even though the game itself is not necessarily, you know, bells and whistles of the of what we'd expect from, you know, 21st century game, it's conveying all this narrative through tiny, tiny bits of storytelling. And for me for that, it just is just incredible storytelling in itself. So for me, that is kind of like it's up there as a great example of what storytelling should be. Do you <sighs> Do you kind of um, have a different process when it comes to storytelling between comics and games? Because, you know, I, I was really interested that you said for you, writing for comics and developing those worlds is what made you want, not only kind of want to write for games, but also have that confidence in yourself that that was something that you could do. So is your process different for them? You know, kind of talk us through, you know, when you've got that kernel of an idea and you start to flesh it out, how does that diverge between those two mediums? Um, it's funny because I think for both mediums, they kind of start in the same way, which is through a lot of research, um, a lot of reading all the books, reading around the subject matter and kind of getting an idea for what the characters are like, the sort of things that they would say in different circumstances, working out the plot, working out the, the story beats, working out themes and environments and all of that, where things start to diverge a little bit is down to naturally the, the differences of the medium themselves. So with comic books, um, that tends to be a bit of more of a solitary thing on, on average. Um, I will sit down and I will kind of, I work out the plot beats, um, I'll work out the, the various kind of important parts of the story. And then I'll try and work out what's best for the medium as well. So for example, um, obviously in a comic book you have the two pages that you're seeing or one page that you're seeing at a time. When you're looking at the typical right-handed page, you have the bottom right-hand corner. We use that as what we call a page turn, which is to put something which is usually to ask a question or to put something really engaging or exciting there to make the reader want to turn the page. So you're plotting your story around emphasizing that page turn to make it really compelling. Um, you know, you're trying to work out if the splash pages are going to be a certain way, if you're using a double page spread or how many issues or parts they are, and then basically dividing the chunks of that story down into, into pieces um, to make it the most compelling way possible. Um, I also have to take an in, in, into account the artist as well that I'm working with. Um, so their style is really, really important to make sure you, you really take advantage of their own talent and make sure that they're happy. Um, one of the artists that I work for in a series that I work on, Magic and Myths, it's the artist who's my co-creator, Sergio Calvet. Um, he quite happily draw anything, but one day I gave him the, the thing to, to basically draw a car. And he was like, I've never drawn any cars before. <laughs> um, so it was a little bit out of his comfort zone, but if I knew that beforehand, I probably wouldn't have challenged him to draw it. So it's, it's working that in and also getting the feedback of what they like and their ideas of the plot and the characters and folding that into the actual whole of the story itself. So after I've done all that and after I've kind of written it all out and I've done all the research and collaborated, I kind of sit down and write the script if I've not already written it. Um, and then it's just a matter of kind of putting the pieces together and, and, and iterating a little bit more. Um, it tends to look a little bit like a screenplay, um, but comic book uh, scripts tend to be a little bit more personal. Um, so screenplays, you have to write it so literally anybody of the film crew can actually read it and understand what's going on. Whereas with a comic book, it's going to usually one person or maybe three people if you need an inker or a colorist and a letterer. Um, so you can actually write it almost like as a love letter <laughs> to your collaborator um, and kind of tailor it specifically to them. Um, so that's when it kind of the process starts. And then when I start getting artwork back, I start to kind of tweak that a little bit more and, and tweak the dialogue so it fits the artwork. Um, games, on the other hand, sprawling, complicated things uh, full of <laughs> machinery and stress by comparison. There's just so many moving parts of games and obviously Yes, you can develop a game by yourself or with a small team. Um, but if you are doing a, a, you know, a typical game, as it were, you're having to consider a lot more 
different parts of of how the game is put together. Um, obviously, I'm the stuff that I'm working on with Silver Rain. I cannot talk about. I will talk around it. I know there are at least half of the people watching are like my team members. Hi guys. The other half is like my family and my wife says, so, hey. So, so I can't talk about the game, um, but I will talk about my experiences on Windrush Tales and some of the, bizarrely enough, some of the stuff that I, I can't announce yet, <laughs> but I, my experiences around them are quite relevant to, to building games. So um, the main thing is with games is that you're constantly charting the feelings of the player. Um, so when I write a comic book, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm trying to work out the emotional beats of what the reader is going through. And, and I mean, writing is all about manipulation. So <laughs> it's manipulating the audience as much as possible to feel what you want them to feel. Um, but with games, uh, it tends to be more kind of like gently ushering them or f sometimes forcing them into doing something. Um, and that's usually expressed through dialogue, through puzzles, through kind of environmental bits and pieces or what have you. Um, and you're tying all of those things to the themes of the game itself. So uh, an example of that would be Windrush Tales. So when I wrote the opening scene of Windrush Tales, and obviously that is revolving around what it's like to be a, an immigrant coming from the Windrush generation into the country and then discovering that large parts of the country um, do not want you in the country. And so the first opening scene that I wrote for that was kind of like me creating exposition for what it's like to be in on the ship, for example, um, the nerves that you have there. Um, also trying to figure out exactly the sort of experiences that you may be encountering later on. So foreshadowing, um, putting down tension, creating a little bit of conflict, setting the scene and making making it all feel natural to the player without them having to suddenly step away from the computer or what have you that they're playing it on. Um, and it's taking all these things into account and figuring out what's the best way for them to interact with those elements um, as possible. Um, generally speaking, because it's a matter of like making sure it's as interactive as possible, there's a lot more iteration by comparison to compared to comic books and other slightly more passive mediums. So when I wrote that opening scene, I, I then gave it to my wife to, to try and, and then I gave it to somebody else. And then they gave me feedback. It's like, are they confused? Do they feel like they're part of the game? Do they, do they understand what they're doing? Do, is it a little bit too complicated? Is it too simple? Um, working all those things out. It's like when I write a comic book, I will usually pass it to the artist and they'll be the person that will feedback straight away because they're working on it. Um, and then occasionally my wife will read it and then she'll go, oh my God, this is terrible, disgusting. It's like, you know, it cuts right to the bone of my emotional core. I don't want to read yourself ever again. And then she'll actually read it again anyway, <laughs> because, because she loves my stuff. <laughs> but with games, it's a lot more iterative. Um, so you're constantly trying to get feedback from players all the time and trying to work out exactly like um, which parts are working, which parts aren't working. Um, and that's a big part of just making sure that the game itself is is working for for the player. And you have to do that. Keep you have to keep on doing that as early as possible and as often as possible, even if it's within the team itself, um, because that feedback is so vital to making sure that just even things from the storytelling to the gameplay is working. Um, and even if the storytelling is coming in at a later point, you're still trying to figure out exactly how smooth that story storytelling narrative is working with the gameplay. So iteration, 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 um, which is complicated and, and obviously time consuming, but it's so, so important um, to the whole process. And it makes things, I guess, a lot smoother in the long run. The games are so expensive these days, um, both for the teams making them, but also for the actual players and audiences themselves. And, and so having that ability to put something down where they feel like this game has actually been play tested and, and it's felt like it's actually been kind of run through from every single stage is I think is absolutely vital. I'm going to rewind a little bit in your career. Um, and before I do, I'm just going to remind everybody that there's a QA, and a a lovely Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your Zoom panel. So do feel free to throw in your own questions as well. We're going to have some time at the end for that. So just letting you know. Um, so yeah, I want to rewind back to PlayStation. 
where we just missed each other, yes. which I'm devastated about. Didn't we? We literally like just crossed over. Yeah. But obviously you were there for 11 years. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you told it so beautifully. I can't believe you met your wife there. It's like, <laughs> it sounds like such an <laughs> idyllic part of your career. Was that, what was that like? You know, I think something I found really interesting when I worked there was this, this balance of still maintaining kind of your, your journalistic flair and, you know, kind of wanting to write the way you would personally just write about a game. And then obviously the fact that you're representing a brand, how did you kind of, because obviously you're somebody who's so creative, who has so much to offer in that kind of, you know, written word uh, form. So how did you, how did you make that fit within a brand that is, you know, to be fair, fairly restrictive and, and fairly protective of, of how they're portrayed to the world? Yeah, it, uh, it wasn't easy at first. <laughs> was, um, like you say, you're going from working as a game journalist and, and, and kind of like, you know, getting into the real weeds of, of the game itself and then moving over to a PlayStation 4 first party and understanding that, yes, this is, this is essentially marketing and there are, there are tools that are there for you to take advantage of. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you are, you are working, you are working for the company at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, it was, it was learning how to, I guess, change my, my focus and my perspective a little bit, not kind of kill that part of me that was, that was used to be a journalist, but being able to put that to one side and reframe my writing perspective a little bit more and being able to understand that, yes, this is a company which is globally renowned and has certain expectations of me um, as a writer to, to go out. And it's, um, it's funny thinking back to those period of time because it was such a transitional period of time. Um, joining during the PlayStation 3 era, um, which was obviously very up and down for the company. It didn't do too well at the start and then it picked up more momentum and, and became more successful. Um, but it was also a, be- a period of time where um, blogs were becoming more popular. <laughs> and it was like, oh, you know, we need to change our writing style a little bit to reflect the fact that these wonderful new blog things are, are kind of like the next hot thing and we need to do that. So there was this long kind of stretch of years where it was just like we were trying to adjust to writing in a certain way, to writing in a slightly more colloquial, kind of relaxed fashion. Um, And that was before PlayStation Blog was actually PlayStation Blog. And then eventually after a period of time, PlayStation Blog actually became its own entity. And um, and that had its own style, its own feel. Um, So even though that took a few years to kind of develop its own identity, when I got moved into working for both PlayStation.com and PlayStation Blog, it was almost working for two different types of entity, even though it was under the same PlayStation umbrella to a certain degree. Um, because again, the audience expectation was entirely different between the two, the two sites. Um, and I think the blog style was actually more towards my journalistic leaning um, at that point as well, because you could really kind of like you go down to interviews and, and really kind of get to more detail as to what the games are about, whereas the PlayStation.com was more about the kind of like giving the, the overview of what a game was essentially. Um, and it definitely helped that, you know, Fred Dutton was, uh, he still is like one of the big PlayStation blog uh, peeps out there and became my manager eventually. And, uh, and he's from also from Eurogamer as well. So we had that thing in common. It was just allowed a nice, easy, gentle kind of fit. So I didn't feel I had to change my writing style a little bit too much to kind of fit in. Um, but it definitely was a, a challenge at the start just to, to reframe myself into that. All right, I'm fast forwarding again. I'm fast forwarding <laughs> all the way to Silver Rain Games. And I know, Abu, Mel, if you're there, I'm not going to make him say anything you shouldn't. I know that you will hunt me down and kill me with your bare hands if I do. But I wanted to ask about what it's like to be part of such a young studio. It seems really exciting. You know, it's, it's diverse. It's got interesting perspectives. It's a newcomer in the industry, but with people who have kind of really brilliant experience uh, and, you know, I mean, I have a very soft spot for Mel. She's brilliant. But, you know, she's somebody who really understands how to get the best out of people. And I think that's something that perhaps some of our studios struggle with in gaming. You know, we're a young industry. These studios kind of pop up out of nowhere. They don't really have an experience in looking after people. So, you know, tell me everything about what it's like to work there. (laughs) 
so terrible. They they hurt me all the time. No, no, they they they're my they're my game. They're family. I absolutely love them. They're they're wonderful, wonderful people, and I. I feel so so lucky to be working with a team that not only is exceptionally diverse and not only exceptionally kind of willing to to let everybody express themselves um, in a way which we think is going to be you know beneficial to everybody and give their own voice, but also everyone's kind of like so open to to hearing from everybody else and also it's there's a fostering kind of development of I guess. Um, Develop, development, funnily enough, um, <laughs> which, which sounds kind of weird because obviously Silver Rain was started at the kind of early start of this year and during the pandemic, um, which means that I think, you know, 99% of the te- team has not met each other um, like face to face in person. Uh, I've met Abu once uh, in an ensemble, which is the same place I met you, um, but I've not met anybody else in the team. I know a few people. Um, but we're not actually met face to face. And it's the same with a lot of other people in the team. Um, but we've managed to create this really strong bond and community already there. And because it is, it has that level of, you know, everybody's voice has um, an equal say in, in what we're doing. Um, everybody feels welcome and everyone feels comfortable within that, which, like you say, isn't very common in the games industry, unfortunately. Um I think it's really easy as well, especially in the games industry, to to feel like you can't make mistakes and that it will be super damaging in your career, even if you're learning. And the sort of atmosphere that Mel and Abu have, have really tried to develop is an atmosphere which allows you to to make mistakes, to to learn and be encouraged and to really kind of like be ushered along in this crazy joyride that we're currently on. Um, and that's so important, um, especially because like in this year in particular, all our mental health is, is going to be a little bit more fragile than it normally would be. So being in a team which is, which is new, which has a, a, a real focus on trying to, trying to kind of guess course or course correct what some of the, the pratfalls that the games industry has known to have over the years um, it's, it's, been, it's been super refreshing. Um, like I like to say, every every day I work with this team, I'm I'm laughing and I'm smiling, and like my wife would go, what, are "You sure you had a team meeting? I just had nothing but laughter from the room. What's going on?" It's like I'm not sure team meetings should be like that. Um, so it's it, it really just shows the ethos of of what's being kind of built at Silver Rain, uh, the culture that's there, it, which is just phenomenal given the fact that. You know, we're all sitting in our rooms, basically, and we barely ever see each other apart from when we're on Zoom calls. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely been an eye opener because um, you have an idealistic view in your head as to what a game studio would be like when you join the game studio. Um, Silver Rain has fit that idealistic view, <laughs> which is bizarre. So uh, so yeah, is that okay, Mel and Abu? Like, did I get that? <laughs> Well, I mean, I am just going to tell you, uh, somebody, that, an anonymous attendee has said, hi, Corey, from everyone at Silver Rain with a heart emoji. And I don't know if that's a veiled threat to let you know that they're here and listening <laughs> or whether it's a genuinely supportive gesture. I guess only you, <laughs> only you can know the answer to that. <laughs> it's, yeah, the, the collar that I'm wearing that you can't see at this moment in time yeah. is, is gently beeping in my ear, which means I've, I've done okay. It hasn't exploded. So that's good. <laughs> Okay, good. I'm glad. If I if I'd blown your head off in the first ensemble salon, I don't think um, anyone would have been very happy with me. It would have been a spectacular failure. <laughs> I am going to jump over to the Q and A because we've had some more questions come in, and I am just I'm watching them stack up. I'm aware people want me to shut up and just and they want to ask their own questions. Um, so let's jump in. The first one is from Karen Bryan. Hopefully, I said your name right. What was the gaming world like when you were a kid compared to now? And have the changes helped or hindered your career? Ah, okay. So uh, Karine is actually the, the, one of the co-founders for Butterfly Books. So, hey, Karine. Ah! <laughs> um, so, yeah, the games industry, sorry, was the game industry when I liked when I joined or the games? What was the gaming world like when you were a kid compared to kind of how it is now? And do you think those changes have helped your career or hindered your career? It was a weird place. I think it was still trying to find its kind of find its feet when I when I kind of first started getting into it. Because, like I said, it was this was during the early '80s when I first started playing. So, um, 
it was a bit of a wild west, I think, um, for a lot of people. And I know trying to learn what the games industry was and, and what the games games were at the time was was an ever changing experience. And I'm kind of putting on my old man hat here at the moment and, and kind of saying, well, you know, it's not like it used to be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, by any means, but it has been, I think there is a tendency to, when we create a, a foundation of what we expect a genre or a medium to be, there is a tendency to then homogenize the experience and, and kind of keep it in one way because it's like video games must be like this. Um, and that, naturally comes with with age and maturity of of the medium itself that does mean that you get these kind of like predictable kind of games every once in a while you know people like the the comfort of predictability um and that has changed dramatically over the period of time where when i first started off you you didn't know what you were getting i mean you would buy a game and the artwork on the box wouldn't be nothing like the actual gameplay itself it'd be just like you would sometimes it'd be amazing and other times it would just be like what the hell is this this is not what i wanted <laughs> and now these days it's like we have these amazing visual displays of, of graphics that really are a lot closer to the actual gameplay itself. Um, and so our expectations are, you know, a little bit kind of like closer to that. Um, and that has brought its own challenges. It has made things slightly more difficult sometimes when you're trying to manage those expectations in itself. Um, and as an old man, it's like, I, I get bored a lot more easily. So, <laughs> so a lot of the time I'm just like, oh, okay, yeah, let's, let's, what's the next thing now? Um, but yeah, I, I try to see through the eyes of like my nieces or my godchildren a little bit more and they're, you know, playing Fortnite and FIFA and loving it. And I'm just like, okay, this, this is why I'm in the games industry for that sense of wonder and enjoyment, regardless of what my old man is saying. So, you know. <laughs> focus on you being an old man tonight i'm very much enjoying it <laughs> <laughs> so um another anonymous attendee asked uh do you have tips for getting into working for a company like playstation through jobs that aren't explicitly about game development i'm just going to jump in first and say they asked about voice acting i'll just let you know Koi won't be able to answer that and if you want to be a voice actor you probably need to go through a voice acting route they work with agencies you'd need that but Corey for kind of anything else maybe you know similar to what you did what would be your tips um basically I think we're in a land an era now where it's a lot easier to be able to do what you want to do on a on a solitary independent basis um when I was a lad, we had libraries and we didn't have the internet. So if you wanted to make a game, it was really, really difficult. You, just, you know, there was stuff there that can, you could learn, but it was a lot more difficult. These days, we have tons of really fantastic books that are available because everyone wants to share their experience. We have the internet. We have things like Twine and Ink and Game Maker that allow you to create games by yourself um, using libraries that are available to you. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. Um, there is a lot of ways that you can try and learn through either courses or through books or what have you to be able to get that experience. But the experience is is absolutely fundamental for people to want to hire you. Um, when I was work, when I started working for PlayStation uh, as a writer, they hired me because I had a foundation of of writing that led me up to that point. Um, obviously, when I and I, like I said about my history, when I got hired by Games Domain, that's because I did courses specifically in writing. Um, and there are so many opportunities out there that allow you to do that and, and get that education. Um, it's a lot more difficult these days, conversely, because there's so much more competition for those places. Um, so that's where it is a little bit trickier. Um, but I think being able to sit down and kind of like just work and hone on your craft um, I do not know everything about writing and I am learning things all the time and I am making mistakes uh, and I am punishing myself for those mistakes. And then I realized that that's really unfair and I shouldn't punish myself. Um, but it's about learning all the time. It's about constantly practicing. It's about using the tools that are out there for free and, and being able to equip yourself for those sorts of jobs. The, the larger the company, the more difficult it's always going to be, but there are openings that are always coming up. And, you know, if you want to be a writer, then, you know, write a blog, 
get out there, get some experience. Um, you know, if you want to write, write, write for games, then, you know, maybe make a choose your own adventure type game like, like I started off with um, and using those tools. There are lots of things out there that can help you do that, but it is a matter of kind of basically getting out there and just, just doing it as much as you can and finding the time to do it. It's not always easy, but it's probably the, the most efficient route for you to, to get there. Fantastic. We are recording this, by the way, for everybody watching, because that was just a huge mountain of really incredible advice. And I was like, I, I know if I was watching, I'd be like scrambling for a notepad. So don't worry. We are recording it. You can go back and listen to that incredible answer again. Um, oh, anonymous attendee. What makes you decide to leave PlayStation after 11 years? And how did you make the transition from PlayStation to working for Silver Rain? Um, so... PlayStation, when you work for PlayStation, they equip this tiny little chip in the back of your neck. <laughs> and after a while, <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you still got it, it's no, okay. Obviously, I'm joking. Um, so, so what happened was it was a confluence of, of lots of little things. Um, I have, like I said, I've got amazing friends at PlayStation. And when I actually did leave, it was actually really, really emotional. But the reason why I ended up leaving was because I wanted to go into, into game dev. And naturally, with, with, it's not just PlayStation, but other companies as well. There's part of, the, of being with those companies is understanding that you may not get the opportunity to work as a game dev because you know, that could be conflict of interest, for example. So um, several things happened. I started working kind of like, or at least pushing myself to work for, to do Windrush Tales. And it was, a, it was such a, a game which spoke to me um, that I thought, you know, this is an opportunity that I, I don't want to pass up. Um, the second thing that happened was that my wife actually got a job in Birmingham, which is where I'm currently living, my hometown. Um, and it was just like, oh, okay, so really um if i want to make sure that you know i like i like my wife i like the marriage to work <laughs> i'd rather move to birmingham rather than try and have a long distance marriage so um so that kind of really made the decisions for me it's like this is a great opportunity to be closer back to my family who are super super supportive um i get to work on games um and i get to kind of keep my marriage going which is great so <laughs> so those all things kind of just stacked up and um it was it was hard. It was actually really hard leaving PlayStation. And to their credit, they they were like just you know freelance with us for another year or so. And they, they probably could have kept me freelancing for a little bit longer, but I had eventually had to leave the freelancing after that point. Um, the transition to Silver Rain. Um, so that was bizarre in itself. So um, I when I got selected. Um, along with yourself and the rest of the ensemble um, peeps, it was uh, that was when I got to meet Abu, who is the CEO of Silver Rain and creative director. Um, and we were just talking, you know, obviously we're all getting to know each other and everything like that. And it's like you, me and Abu were just kind of chatting and everything. And then obviously I mentioned that I was a writer and he said, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. Let's, let's have a chat. So we got talking after that point. Um, and what, proceeded to happen was kind of like a uh, a kind of semi-interview <laughs> is the best way for me to try and describe it um you know we got to know each other but um abu kind of like sent me over some stuff is like this is sort of stuff i'm working on um what do you think and then i was like wow this is amazing and i sent like two thousand words of like we could do this and we could do that and this is like what about this and he was like oh my god oh my god this is great Okay, so we had another chat and then he sent me some more stuff. And then I sent him about 4,000 words of stuff afterwards. And he was just like, okay, right, okay, so when are you free? <laughs> so we got chatting some more. Um, so from my perspective, that was typically speaking, when you apply for a narrative designer job or a writer job in game dev, you have to go through a writing test and an interview. And this writing test can be anything from um, you know, several thousand words of writing a script or what have you, or kind of like writing down your ethos on, on narrative design or what have you. I've done several over my career. Um, and what I did with Abu was essentially a writing test and an interview that I didn't realize I was doing. <laughs> um, and as a result, it was like, I ended up being kind of like, kind of like, oh, you know, this, this is actually quite cool. This, uh, oh, you, you want me to do what? You want me to be part of this team? Oh, okay. That, uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so that's how I kind of got folded in. And, and as a result, it was like, um, 
I really kind of got to hone more of those skills. Um, like I said, Silver Rain are very supportive about, you know, making sure that you feel integrated and feel comfortable and happy with what you're doing. Um, and so that was really kind of a big part of it. But the fact that I also had been a content producer for games like Horizon Zero Dawn and Uncharted Lost Legacy and God of War and, and all these big AAA games and had been writing comic books for 15 years now um, kind of gave me all that foundation to be able to do the stuff that I did that allowed Abu to kind of say, yeah, okay, we would like to hire you. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a very strange, quick transition, um, but um, I'm certainly very, very grateful to have made it. Well, one of the, I think this is probably going to be our last question. So um, we had another anonymous question, which was, what what are the biggest challenges in your current position? And because it's our final question, and because you're somebody who just speaks with such like uh, joy and passion about what you do, I kind of want to, to balance that out. So I think, give us kind of your biggest challenge in your career. And also, you know, the thing that makes you most excited, the thing that you love most about what you do. Okay. Um, biggest challenge in my career, uh, overcoming, um, the critical voice in my head. Um, I know that sounds a bit vague, but it's, it is something which I think, especially, you know, any creatives suffer from that over critical voice, whether it's imposter syndrome, whether it's actual, you know, mental illness, you know, I, I suffer from depression. I'm, I'm, I try to be as open about that as possible. And yes, I've been working in the games industry for 20 years, but throughout those 20 years, I have constantly been battling that voice and kind of working out exactly what I want to do, where I want to be, the sort of person that I want to be in my career. And, you know, whether that was like being asked to interview, um, I got asked to interview Dizzy Rascal when I was working for PlayStation. And I immediately went into my shell because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much an introvert. And I was like, I, I don't think I can do it. Um, and stuff like that continued to happen. And I look back at those moments and I wish I could have told my younger self just to go for it and just to leap out and, and make those sort of decisions, which, you know, they may not have changed my career in any way, but they would have given me that little bit more of a confidence just to, to continue building on. Um, and that is something it's, it's an ongoing battle. Even like this week, I was, I could hear the voice like nipping at me a little bit. Um, and it's just it's working out the best ways to to move around that and get around it and, and work out um, ways to counterbalance that. Um, I know that's probably super kind of anonymous <laughs> by comparison to what I've been asked in terms of like a specific challenge, but that is that is an ever present challenge for me. Um, in terms of like the, I guess career highlights and the stuff that I'm kind of proud of, and um, there, there's quite a lot of stuff that I feel has been formative in in my career and you know whether that was being able to interview um incredible influential people um that have been i say influential in the sense of like personally influencing me or, or influencing larger people like um shigeru Miyamoto and hideo kojima and ueda san and, and all those people that have shaped the industry and being able to to talk to them and talk to them and understand their point of view in, you know, that, that short space of time that you get with them. Um, that has helped me to, to help calm that critical voice a little bit more um, and, and being able to take their words and put them into something that people will be will want to enjoy to read. Um, being able to work on Windrush Tales, something that important um, that for me personally, being of, of Caribbean heritage is also something that, has been a big deal uh, for me. Yes, the game is still development and it's, you know, there's lots of things which are kind of we're trying to work out to, to get it moving along, but it, it's, that has certainly been a massive, massive deal. And, and to be honest, this year, as crazy and as difficult as this year has been, it has been an absolute blessing to have been brought into the company that I'm not allowed to talk about as, as like, you know, a consultant um, sort of thing and Silver Rain as well. Um, and King and, and being able to work with ridiculously talented people. Um, again, I'm talking around stuff when the stuff is unveiled, it, it would all make sense. Um, but yeah, it's having those opportunities, having people come up to me and say, 
yeah, we want to work with you on X, Y, and Z. And then seeing X, Y, and Z and going, oh my God, okay, you, you trust me enough <laughs> to, to want to contribute towards these things. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically the 11-year-old me going, how the hell did you do that? You jammy git. Just <laughs> what, what did you do? Please tell me. Um, and then that is, it's nice to be able to, to look back at that younger self and, and kind of say, you know, do hang in there, do, it will be difficult and there will be, there will be heartbreak, but you will be able to do something that will make you happy and make you feel fulfilled along with people that, that also make you happy and make you feel fulfilled. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> What a wonderful place to end. If we didn't know already that you were just a spectacular storyteller and a wonderful writer, I think that gorgeous answer totally gave it away. Um, I'm going to have to wrap things up, but before we go, tell everybody, you know, where they can find your work, where they can look you up, because I'm sure, you know, anybody who wasn't already familiar with you is going to run out and do that now. <laughs> um, so I am in the very fortunate position to be the only Quarry Brotherson on the entire internet. So as long as you get my name right, which is, is fairly easy, it's Quarry and brother and son, as in relation, um, then you'll find me. But I do have a website, QuarryBrotherson.com. Um, my Twitter is Quarry Brotherson as well. My Instagram is Quarry Brotherson. I am super easy to find, <laughs> which I'm sure is going to backfire on me at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, you can find me on any social media. You can find me on my website. It's, I am there. Please feel free, ask me questions, ask me anything. I'll, I'll try my best to, to help you and give back to an industry that has given so much to me. Well, thank you so much for this evening. I've absolutely loved talking to you. As I said, you know, you're a storyteller, you're a born storyteller. It has been absolutely wonderful to sit and chat with you this evening. So a huge thank you from me and I assume everybody else watching Corey Brotherson there. Do go and check him out. You know, as he said, he's the only Corey Brotherson you'll be able to find him. And of course, he's going to be taking over the reins. He's going to be uh, hosting our next ensemble salon and he'll be interviewing Nahal Theroux, who is from Electric Noir Studios. They're a BAFTA nominated studio. They are absolutely fantastic. He is very, very interesting. And obviously you've already seen how good Corey is. So make sure you tune in for that one. But for now, that's it. I've been Ella Sillywood. I've been talking to the wonderful Corey Brotherson and this has been an ensemble salon with Games London. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much.